My, my message that we're going to be talking about today is going to be Mission Impossible. And based on the context of, and the content of what's, what's in Romans chapter 9, uh, that's part of it as well. But I think I found out the reason why it's called Mission Impossible is I'm having to cover Romans chapter 9 verse 30 through all the way through chapter 10. So that's, that's one reason why it's Mission Impossible. Uh, <laughs> because all the other gentlemen, they're, they're looking at about 10 verses or so in 45 minutes, and we've got a chapter and a third or so. Uh, but we'll get, we'll get through it. <clears throat> um, so go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 9. And I'm going to start off in verse 30. I'm going to read verse uh, 30 through 33, and uh, we'll get going. What, what we're going to be looking at is... Um, an explanation of why the pursuit of righteousness through works is futile, and also take a look at the explanation of Israel's failure to recognize her Messiah uh, when, when he showed up. <clears throat> so Romans chapter 9, we're going to start off in verse 30, and I'll read through verse 33, and we'll get going. What shall we say then? That the, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in a stumbling stone, and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we take and open our hearts and our minds to your word and allow your word to be the issue, not just in the, in the, in the passage, what we're dealing with here, but in our life as well. Allow your word to work in and through us that we might be able to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So as we go through in Romans chapter 9, we've come through, and Brother David was talking about the delay principle yesterday. And then <clears throat> Brother Matt was talking about how God's reshaping things. And I got to thinking last night, and, and Brother Alex said something last night that made me think of some things as we're going down through here. If you look and you notice here in verse 32, one of the, one of the objections that we have is, well, you've got these guys out here, these Gentiles, as he says, <clears throat> notice, verse 30, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to the righteousness? But what about us as Israel? And as you, as you think, in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul kind of pauses for a second and says, well, let's talk about what's happened to Israel. right? And we get down here to verse 32, and we find out the real issue. They say, wherefore? He says, because they sought it not by faith, but as it, was, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Well, we find out who that stumbling stone is when we read the next verse. We find out that it's a, it's a person. It's not just some rock that they're walking along and they trip over and they, they try to catch themselves or anything. But it's a person. And we see that it says, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And so what he's coming down to is he's taking a look at this, and we first of all, let's go real quick. I don't want to step on the folks in front of me, but we do want to mention this real quick because when he says here, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, if we miss and say that Israel fell here at the cross, we lose some things in Romans chapter 9 and chapter 10. If we understand that they stumbled here and then they fell in Acts chapter 7, then this makes a whole lot more sense. And the Bible all of a sudden becomes more open to us and we can understand some things. And as we come down through here, we find out... <clears throat> Go over to Romans chapter 11 real quick. Because <clears throat> I just want to mention this as we... In, in, in the context of what we're dealing with here. They stumbled, Right? We go over to Romans chapter 11, verse 11. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God's answer is, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, one of the things that we see over in Romans chapter 
10 that we're going to have to be able to deal with is there is a provoking of the nation of Israel that was prophesied. But then Paul comes along and says, oh, by the way, there's another provoking of the nation of Israel that was held and kept secret. Right? And that's what he's talking about over in Romans chapter 11. But the connection is what? They stumble here at the cross, but they don't fall. They go a little way, approximately about a year, and they stumble and fall. And through that fall, salvation has gone to the Gentiles. And so when we're taking a look at this, because everybody wants to know, well, what happened to Israel? Well, if we're not replacement Israel, then what happened to Israel? Back, back home in Frankfurt at the school that I taught, that I teach at, <coughs> um, the, the principal's no longer there, but the principal that was there before, he's, he's a Calvinist. And we had, we had talks all the time, and he says, well, Paul was the greatest Calvinist because you read Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. I was like, you're missing the whole point of Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. And he says, well, I think you spiritualize the verses too much. And I'm like, you're the one that says that the kingdom's here. It's just not realized yet. If you want to talk about spiritualizing passages, that's what takes place. But when we come here, what he's talking about is he's dealing with the fact that, Israel, you missed your Messiah. <clears throat> the thing that, that Brother Alex said last night that, that kind of hit me and solidified this, and it kind of goes along with what Matt was talking about earlier with the reshaping principle that we have in the first part or the middle part of Romans chapter 9. God, God did that apostate nation of Israel one of the greatest favors through reshaping right here. And here's why. And I, I, just, I just want you to recall your, in your mind, go to 1 John chapter 4. When we see that Israel stumbled... At that stumbling block, that rock of offense, when they stumbled at Jesus Christ, the reason they stumbled at that is because they didn't realize that their Messiah was there. Why? Because they were trying to do things on their own. They said, give us some laws, we'll keep them. How'd that work out? Here's the thing. We've got churches all over the country and all over the world that's saying, here's this list of stuff. If you can check off that list, then you're saved. And if you miss a one, that's what, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you all are, are familiar with Scientology. When they first created that, they had, a, they had a list of curriculum that you had to pay for to get into and go through. Well, people got through with it too quickly. So they had to create more classes and more curriculum. And then they keep building this and they say, when you get to the top, well, you got to go down to the bottom and start over again and repay. And you're talking about thousands and millions and millions of dollars that people put into this, hoping that they might be able to get some sort of inkling of Christ or something other than the life that they have. <clears throat> when we think about... I saw a thing this morning. <clears throat> I don't know how many people this is going to hit, but sometimes you think that you know you're kind of useless in some some situations. When you're in that religious system, you feel you're useless. Um, just remember that the old Nokia 3310 phones, you could buy a case for those. Now Nokia Nokia cell phones back in the day were virtually indestructible. Why would you need a case on that? <laughs> a case for a Nokia 3310 phone is useless because it's virtually indestructible. And that's how a lot of people end up feeling because that system that, that, system that says if you check these things off, well, what happens when you check them all off? Well, I didn't get what I was, what I, what I was told I was going to get. Well, you have some secret sin in your life. You have something that you've not confessed that you're holding back and you need to come out and they give you something else to do. 
Now, when we think about that, that's what the nation of Israel was doing all the way through here. Give us some stuff and we'll do it. And they missed their Messiah. And here's, here's one reason why they should be thankful. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. What did the apostate nation of Israel say about Jesus Christ? He's not here. Now why is that important? Notice. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh, is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Their Messiah shows up and they miss Him. Because they were going about trying to do things on their own rather than by faith. Just go back and read the verses and find out when you see these signs and you see these wonders and when this person is born, you're going to be able to find out who he is. It's very clear. So when they come to the end of this and they still have not thought that Jesus Christ had come, what do we find out? They're not of God. What are they? They're deserving of His wrath. And so what did He have to do? That reshaping. They owed God a debt of gratitude because before if they messed up, reshape them. Before they messed up, reshape them. Get here, you miss the Messiah. Guess what they're going to do over here? They're going to find out. They're going to, they're going to believe that the guy's coming is the Christ because he's doing those signs, he's doing those wonders, and they're going to fully believe that that's the one. And you got to think, take this out for a second, when they were coming through here, and they get to this point, and that wrath is getting ready to fall, because Stephen sees Jesus Christ standing in the right hand of God the Father, and he, he know, the people know that that wrath is about to fall, and because of that, one of those things that they're going to do is, they're going to find out out here, and what God does is says, Hold up. It's time for me to reveal something that is going to help that problem. And that's why I say the nation of Israel, that apostate nation, God did them a tremendous favor by interrupting that. All right? Go over to Acts chapter 2 real quick. <clears throat> When we get over to Acts chapter 2, we'll start reading in verse 22. This is, of course, on the day of Pentecost. Peter's standing up. Verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel. So we already know who he's talking about. He says, Hear these words. What we're going to find out as we go back through here and we start talking about that works is futile. Really what God's looking for is faith in what His Word says. Right? So He says, Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by Him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You missed your Messiah. And so what should happen is, is they should automatically be able to think about, well, then that means bad news for us. But notice this, drop down, drop down to verse 33. Well, let's start off in verse 30. Chapter 2, verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. 
He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell, neither was his neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus, the same Jesus that I just got through talking to you about about ten verses ago, this same Jesus that you by wicked hands have crucified and slain, he says, This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are we all we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which he now sent. You missed the boat. Peter's standing here on the day of Pentecost and says, Here's your opportunity. Here's the Christ that came in and he did the wonderful, wonderful works and the signs and the wonders and all that stuff. You've missed the boat. Your Messiah was here and you have crucified him. That same, that same Jesus, notice in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, that same Jesus, which Jesus, whom ye crucified, what's he done? Made him both Lord and Christ. And what's your natural response to that? If you're a member of the nation of Israel, what do we need to do? And he says, Men and brethren, what shall we do in verse 37? 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Change your mind about who you think that this guy was and understand that he was the Messiah because this evidence is clear. Had you actually paid attention to what the words on the page said and believed in your heart, then you would have known when he showed up. But because, go back to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Why? Why did they not attain? Because they sought it not by faith. God said, Here, here's all the clues when the Messiah shows up, when Christ shows up, you're going to be able to know because I'm giving you all the clues. You know, Brother Jordan mentioned the passage where everybody says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared him for them who love him. My biggest pet peeve is when somebody quotes that verse. Because then they say, Well, you just don't know. <laughs> growing up, growing up, my dad was a Baptist preacher. I usually I usually talk about it more Baptocostal is what I kind of think of it as, but he was a Baptist preacher. <clears throat> yeah, that one's kind of weird too. But he was a Baptist preacher. <clears throat> and I was talking to some folks yesterday. Um, my dad grew up and he was listening to Kenneth Copeland and all these guys, so dad didn't have a job. He wouldn't let mom have a job because we were waiting on God to give us money. Have four kids. Every time a plane would fly over, he was waiting for it to drop a bag of money to us. What's that? Not seeking by faith. And so when we get to this, <clears throat> he's saying, the reason that you missed him, all the clues were there. All you had to do is read the verses and find out when this happens, there he is. When this happens, there he is. When this happens, there he is. You know, you think <clears throat> where the passage says where two or three witnesses are gathered. You know, you, you think of if you have two or three witnesses of something taking place, there's more than two or three verses that says when this guy shows up, this is what he's going to do. When Christ shows up, this is how you're going to know. And they sought it by doing things, right? 
Keep on going in, in chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. My dad was zealous in the fact that God's going to provide for us and we're just going to have to wait. You can be zealous about the wrong thing. And so what he's talking about here is you can have a great zeal. I mean, Paul, was, Paul had great zeal, right? He persecuted the church. He was zealous. <clears throat> but not according to knowledge. There's information that if we read the Bible, had, had Israel read the scriptures that they had at that particular time, they would have been able to have known and said by faith, there he is. But they were out here doing, well, I got this checklist. Oh, I got this checklist. I've got this. No, I know. I know he's doing stuff, but I've got this and I've got this. They completely missed it. Continue on. <clears throat> Verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. When we think about what's going on here, go real quick to 1 Timothy chapter 4. When people, when people quote, I hath not hear, I hath not heard, he hath not seen, when they quote that verse, I always like to say, well, let's read the next verse. God, the other thing that I always had with my dad talking to him about was um, whether or not the, the, the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, was pre-trib. And he always told me, well, you need to be saved just in case. When that's, that's what that verse is saying, we don't know. Just wait and see. God's got His timing, and, and if things work out, then they work out. But the next verse tells us that God's revealed something to us in the book, in the Bible, that we can have, that we have right in front of us, every one of us has in front of us right now, that we can know some things, and we don't have to be ignorant of some stuff. As we take a look, notice 1 Timothy chapter 4. Start in verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up where? In the words of faith. The words are the issue. The words on the page is the issue, always has been, always will be. And our faith placed in what those words say about us and say who we are. We were talking to you about yesterday in the seminar. I don't wake up every morning feeling like I've been made the righteousness of God in Him. But what do I know? Because of the verse tells me I've been made the righteousness of God in Him. I believe that verse and I move on with my day. Amen. Understanding some information about who He's made me and how He's living His life and His Word through me day by day and allowing that to be the issue. And so when we talk about this, he, He's saying... If thou, put, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. You know, it's not just enough to believe the Bible. You've got to believe the Bible correctly. It's not just enough to study the Bible, but it's, not, but it's sound doctrine as well. The form of sound words, when you build up that doctrine into your soul, and that's one of the greatest things that I found out through the school. It took me a long time to get through the great school of the Bible, but that last, that third year I got done pretty quickly because the word started working in me and made me want to do that. And this is, what, this is the issue. The words and the page is the issue. 
and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Where do we find out about that godliness? Well, you just talked about it in the end of chapter 3, right? The mystery of godliness, the fact that God would manifest, the fact that God would take you and I and manifest His life through our flesh. And He would choose and allow us to be a part of what He's doing. And He says, For bodily exercise profiteth, profiteth little. That's not talking about don't go to the weight room. That's not saying, don't go work out. What he's saying is, you doing works in your flesh will profit little. Contrast that with the next thing that he says. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. A lot of times when we start talking about the life that we can live now, our daily walk, it's not just now, but it's for the ages to come as well. And we talk about the things that we're going to be able to do to glorify Jesus Christ in ourselves then, but we can also do that now. And that's the idea of being able to allow God to live through us. When we take and allow the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly and that Word actually comes in and it performs things. You know, God... The Word of God which effectually worketh in you that believe. It's not the Word of God that effectually works in you that do good works. When we believe the words on the page and allow that word to live in us, then what's going to take place is it's got nothing to happen but come out. You know, Brother Matt was talking about the vessel. There's a lot of people back home, one of the ladies tells me, isn't it just enough that I'm saved? Well, she's got a vessel, nothing in it. Put something in it. What are we going to put in it? The book that we have in front of us. The words on the page, when we take that stuff in and we study it and we allow that to live in us and to dwell in us, then that's going to come out. And that's what he's talking about here. For bodily exercise profiteth little. You doing stuff doesn't get you anywhere. Allowing the word of Christ to dwell in us richly so that we can actually allow that to live through us by faith. We just... We're crazy enough just to believe the words on the page and allow them to be the issue. When we see a verse that says, let him that stole steal no more. You know what a person that used to steal does? Stop stealing. That applies to everything. Let him that lied, lie no more. But it's not us doing it. We know that's what Romans 6 is all about, right? Being able to take those sins, we don't have to do those things anymore. And if I do it, Romans 7 says, it's just this flesh that I have to carry around until that catching away or death, I get to get rid of it. And I have to carry this around and have to deal with this sin nature that I have. That's what Romans 7 is all about. We talk about back home, we, we, we go through, we've been going through Romans for a while. That spirit, soul, and body. Our spirit is filled with the word. Our body's filled with just junk. And they're fighting all the time for that soul. And what, what should win is when we get this book and we get it in us, it's, but godliness is profitable unto all things. How's that work? It's, it's God living His life through you. Go back to Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> you know, when we think about how works are futile, give us something, we'll do it. 
That's never worked. You go back to Genesis chapter 3. First institution of religion. Adam and Eve find themselves naked all of a sudden. What do they do? They're ashamed. What's religion do? Makes you ashamed. When you see here, back up real quick, Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 33, and we'll see this a couple other times. Romans chapter 9, verse 33 says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be, what? Ashamed. It's not about religion. It's not about doing stuff. They were saying, well, we've got to do stuff. When you, go back to, when you go back to Adam and Eve, they find out that they're naked all of a sudden and they're ashamed and they say, well, we've got to cover ourselves. And when God shows up, they go hide themselves because they're ashamed. And they do what? They make them some fig leaf clothes. Well, what happens to leaves when you take them off a branch? They die. They wither. Well, what do you have to do? Go pluck another one. <clears throat> Go real quick. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Start off in verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. When we think of that verse, the first thing that pops into my mind is 2 Timothy 2.15. We're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Right? The next thing that pops into my mind is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All doctrine is given by, all scripture is given by inspiration, and it may be profitable and for, for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction, righteousness. Why? The man of God may be. What could these things not do that the Word of God does for us? They can't, those works could not have made them perfect. What does the Word do? The, the reason that it's there is to make us perfect. To make us mature. Not sinless perfection that we can walk around higher than everybody else thinking we're something. But notice, <clears throat> for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. When God talks about those things, what did He, call, what did he, what did he say in the Old Testament about those sacrifices? Their stench in His nostrils. And they're going about trying to do this stuff themselves on their own. And it just leads to them stumbling over the stumbling block because had they read the verses, they would have found out who their Messiah was when he showed up. You know, we go back, go back to Romans. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4, we find out, what did Abraham find out about his flesh? Can't do it. That was before the law, right? Notice in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, what do we know about you right now in the dispensation of the grace of God? You're what? Under sin. What do we find out about what the purpose of the law is? Go down to verse 19. Now we know 
that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. Do you know what the law does? It says, shut up. You can't do it. Yeah, but look at what... Shut up. You know, it's one of those things people say, don't, don't tell people to shut up these days. You know what the law does? It says, stop talking. Yeah, but you don't know. Look at what I've done. Every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. The only reason that the law exists is to let you know that you're a sinner. And what do we do? In order to be able to get somebody to understand that they need a Savior, they first need to know what? They're a sinner. They need a Savior. So the only thing that we need the law for, if we use it lawfully, is to what? It's a schoolmaster to bring us into Christ so that we know that we need Him. And He says, you can't do it. You're never going to be able to do it no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you want to, you're not going to be able to accomplish what God through Christ has done for you. And that's the issue. The only purpose of the law is to let us know you can't do it and so when they're over here bragging in Romans chapter 9 or complaining I guess saying these guys these Gentiles they got it they didn't do what we did they didn't follow after the law we followed after the law <clears throat> we deserve it that's basically what they're saying there as we go through here notice Chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the, righteous, the, the, describeth the righteousness which is of the law that, a, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. You know, we, we, in order for us to be able to fulfill the law, we would have had to have been right 100% of the time. Years ago, back when we used to meet at our old church back home, I went to, to get some gas one day at a gas station in, in, my, in my gas can to mow. And the lady, lady working there, she says, You're getting gas to mow? You're going to mow on a Sunday? I'm like, You just sold me gas. <laughs> You're working on a Sunday, and then you're going to stand there. <clears throat> How dare you work on a Sunday? You're doing the same thing. But that's what that stuff leads to. It's not of knowledge, but it's of ignorance. Right? So as we come down through here, notice. <clears throat> as we get through into this passage right here, this is, you know, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 it was mentioned yesterday, it's a bloody battleground. <clears throat> People come in here and they try to bring in Calvinism and they try to bring in things like, well, you have to confess in order to be saved and things like that because they miss what's going on here. Right? The whole issue here is what? The words on the page. And you believe in them. Right? Keep on going. Verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart. <clears throat> Did you know your heart can speak? He says, say not in your heart. So that means you can say something in your heart or not say something in your heart. Keep that in mind as we go through. Who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring Christ again from the dead? If you want something real fascinating to go back and study, take those two passages and go back and find out what Paul or what, what, what Paul brings that from and see how he replaces the word Christ there with something else. Go study that out. Verse 7, or verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. 
What's in their mouth? The Word. What's in their heart? The Word. Keep on going. But what saith it, the Word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the Word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... What's the information that tells them that Jesus was the Christ? That He was the Messiah? The words. Where were the words? In their heart. In their mouth. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall what? Not be ashamed. The thing that's in their mouth and in their heart is the Word. What's their heart able to do? Speak something? What's it able to speak? Out of the mouth or out of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. He's not talking. Notice he says, and we talked about this before, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess, notice it doesn't say profess. Confession is what? Agreeing with God on what He says. He doesn't say, speak it out. You don't have to go and stand on a stage and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the, I believe that Jesus is the Christ and I believe that He died and He buried and He rose again. That's not what He's talking about. He's saying, allow the things that you have in your heart and in your mouth already, just agree with it. It's already there. As we get down through... <clears throat> Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Why would, why would you not be ashamed? For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. <clears throat> By the way, not only does apostate Israel owe God a great debt of gratitude, but by the way, you and I do as well. Because had it not been for their stumbling and their eventual fall, we wouldn't be in this room right now. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about the Apostle Paul and the dispensation of the grace of God. So we think... We owe, we owe God a great debt of gratitude because in His infinite wisdom, He said, I'm going to do something from before the foundation of the world. He says, I'm going to do something to reclaim my position as ruler over heaven and earth, and I'm going to do it through two different agencies. One of them I'm going to tell you about, and one of Satan's things is that you can't keep a secret from him. And what did God do? He kept a secret from him. And we get down through here, and the issue as we go down, <clears throat> now that we know that works are futile, there's nothing we can do, bodily exercise, the stuff that we do profiteth little, but we know that godliness gets it all. As we get down through here, notice <clears throat> verse 12. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. People say, see, all you got to do is just call on the name of the Lord and you're going to be saved. As Gentiles, we don't have... Think of it. With the nation of Israel, did they have some sort of an advantage over us? Inasmuch as they had the oracles of God. We didn't. As you go down through here, notice he says, <clears throat> How should they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the gospel. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For, for Isaiah says, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, 
faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So somebody says, <clears throat> I've gotten in this book and I found out what God's doing through me and I want to go and do that and I want to preach that to people and what do they do? They're going to get in this book and they're going to go and they're going to preach to people and then what's going to happen to people when they hear it preached? They're going to believe. Right? And when they believe, they now have the Word of God where? And they could have believed. I like that. <clears throat> Back home, we're a small group, so we, we go for a couple hours or so. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a guy that we do, we do a pal talk on Monday nights uh, for Fred Beckemeyer, um, RL, and, and myself, and a couple other of us. We, we do Monday night pal talks. And Frank asked me one night, he says, I, I, I have a question. How in the world do you get those people to sit and listen and listen to you for two hours? I have no idea, but nobody's complained yet. You know, as we come down through here, it's, it's the Word of God takes something. It takes us, and when we allow it to dwell in us, what it's going to do is it's going to start working in us effectually that believe, and it's going to start doing a work in us. God's the one that started the work. And he's going to perform it. How is he going to perform it? Because he gave us a book to study. And we by faith, by simple faith, believe in the words on the page, we allow that to be the issue and go live that. And what's going to happen? We're going to preach the gospel and all that. Now I understand in the context, this is, he's not talking about us going and getting people saved. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Had they figured it out the first time, they wouldn't have been in that mess. But thank God that they got in a mess. For our sake... Thank God that they got in a mess. Works are futile. They miss their Messiah, but because they miss their Messiah, you and I have an opportunity to salvation. And not just salvation, but we can glorify God, not just out there in the ages to come, but we're allowed to do that now because God's working in us, in, in us when we believe the Word. Father, we thank you for the time that we have here. Study your Word. The fact that you've not left us here alone, but you have revealed everything unto us that you want us to know that we can actually live a life that would be glorifying to you and your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.